Hey guys, it's Dotson with another Low Poly Panda review. This time we're looking at the 25th installment of the Need for Speed series, Need for Speed Unbound, which brings in some new graphical changes, a new location, a new story, some new cars. But is it all worth it in the end? Let's find out. The Criterion developed Unbound brings in a new art direction, this time adding some graffiti-like cell shading to the cars for burnouts, airflow, some flare, like when you jump or when you slide. The player characters get the same treatment, but the world and cars don't, so it's kind of a hard contrast between the two, but we'll talk about that in the graphics. First, I want to clarify that this game is the first in the series to be strictly for the new gen PS5, Xbox Series X and S. It dropped at the beginning of December, but you can already find it 30 to 40 percent off at some retailers. There's two editions up for grab, the normal everyday version for 70 bucks or the Palace Edition for another 10. I was a sucker enough to buy into the Palace Edition and let me tell you what it gets you. A driving effect. Some in-game clothing, a couple of decals, and a pose you show off at the end of a race. Real groundbreaking stuff for ten dollars, right? I know some of you might be thinking, but it comes with four custom cars. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> Look, the listing says a 2020 AMG GT Black Series, a 76 Golf GTI, an E30 M3 Evo, and an AMG G63 G-Wagon. Doesn't sound like a bad roster of cars to get, especially when money in the game can be a little tight, but you don't actually get them. What $10 of real life currency gets you in, in game is the opportunity to buy them, eventually. See, the cars are available to purchase only after you advance in the game. So the Black Series Merc isn't even available until you're almost 75% done with it. And I might add, the car is already in the game normally for purchase. All the Palace Edition is, is pre-mounted versions of vehicles that are already available for purchase, but they have a special livery. It's a complete waste. First bit of consumer advice in this video, do not buy the Palace Edition. That aside, let's get into the game itself and figure out if that should be avoided as well. First up, as always, we want to look at graphics. We move from Miami and Need for Speed Heat and go to Lakeshore, which as far as I could tell is kind of like a Chicago-esque city. It has plenty of bascule bridges, underground sections, and generally isn't that memorable of a map. Payback I didn't think was a great game, but even for all its misses, had a lot of unique memorable sections of the map. Heat had some fewer, but still had some. Unbound's World just seems kind of meh. Visually, it looks fine and the cars are great but it all feels bland, especially for being a next-gen game. I still feel like 2015's reboot might have even looked better. The new art style of cell shading on the characters makes a weird juxtaposition against the hyper-realism on the cars. And the character models seem like they're over-brightened, so when you look at night, sitting in a car, you look like a Christmas tree lit up. The art style doesn't really do anything for me, especially on the driving itself. I don't need wings to sprout out when I jump, or drawn anime style circles around my wheels when I break traction. I think it would work better if the whole game was transitioned to that art style, like a uh, Automotalista, instead of just adding some artwork to character models changing. I'd say it's serviceable, but nothing groundbreaking. Lighting's pretty good on the cars at night, although at speed I did get some pop in on the PS5 with some obstacles, so you hit that S plus tier and you're going over 200 miles an hour through the city at night. You might be surprised at what pops up in front of you that you need to react to. Moving on to sound though, the voice acting's fine. The cars are infinitely tunable for audio, so you can adjust their exhaust overrun, how loud the forced induction is, and the tone of the exhaust. Music is typical of EA's new generation of heavy bass background music that doesn't really have any standouts. Gone are the days that Snoop is dropping riders on the storm on a Need for Speed game. There is some music that gets more tense in a chase, but it's mixed overly loud and it plays far too long even after the chase has ended. Speaking of the music, it's... Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. I've had whole sections of driving where there's just nothing. A song will end and nothing else will pop on. Every once in a while, an ad from the mayor will pop on to lightly tie into the story, or you'll get a call from your narrative companions to discuss a recent race or upcoming event, but at absolutely no point did I feel these were necessary. You'll miss nothing if you mute the game and turn on Spotify while you drive. The real meat of any game, though, is the gameplay. In this case, the story's no surprises. It's betrayal, double cross, followed by another double cross, loosely held together by racing. You pick a starter car out of this garage you work at with a guy who pretty much adopted you, 
which I guess starts kind of like child slavery. Cool, 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 cool. And then you build it up, do some races in the prologue, only to have your companion Yaz steal your ride and everything from the garage. There's no rush to catch him, and you and Rydell just sit there and watch them drive off in what is hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of vehicles. Without so much as like a, hey, you bitch. You smash cut to two years later, and some benefactor comes in, buys you a ride, and you start earning money for the garage. You find out about a street scene race going on where they have qualifiers every Saturday, culminating in a big race at the end of the four weeks. The weeks are all split in a day and night cycles, except on that Saturday qualifier where it's just night. So there's 13 sections of racing each week. Day doesn't pay as much as night, and your heat level stays with you from the day to the night, but doesn't carry over into the next day. So effectively, you leave in the morning, you do a couple races or car deliveries, you get back to the garage, you go out again with some added heat, you do some more races, get some more cash. The heat depends on the race that you do. It could build in half a heat level or two or three heat levels for a race, all the way up to a max of five. The heat levels bring new cops from the basic Dodge Chargers you can bully around, Explorers you can't bully but you can outrun, Corvettes that you can wreck by sneezing at them, undercover Camaros that don't show up on the map, and for whatever reason the tier 5 heat is a Ford Raptor which is somehow the fastest car in the game. You don't get bonus cash like you did in heat for the higher heat level, but the races, I don't know, they're, I'd say they're affected, cops seem to show up randomly. Sometimes you'll still get chased after the race ends, even though the cop was nowhere near you. It's, it's a weird system. All the races have a buy-in, and there's a small payout. So even in week three, when you're over halfway done with the game, there might be a $25,000 race, but there's a $12,000 buy-in. After side bets, you can bring home $14,000 in the race. And speaking of side bets, talk about adding a bonus to the AI. There's no rubber banding in this game, which thank god they got rid of that, Need for Speed used to be terrible with it. But you can choose to do a side bet against one racer, and effectively it's a grand extra you might get, but you're giving them a huge bonus. It doesn't matter if you pick the top guy or the bottom guy on the list by car, anybody I made a side bet with all of a sudden had an extra 25 miles an hour to show for it. You can technically skip almost whole weeks to burn through the story element of the game because I had enough to upgrade to the next tier car after week one and had won enough cars that I didn't really need cash. There's four classes of cars, B, A, S, and S+. Since there's four classes and four weeks, I bet you can guess what the race theme is. You level your car to the next tier for the next week, and that's how you progress. There's some story elements that come in I won't spoil, but it's pretty much stupid. Everybody's friends at the end because of course they are. The whole game, they go on about having to make money for the garage, but you're pulling in 150000 a week in racing for a little five-bay garage and somehow you can't survive. I think there's something else wrong with the business that illegal street racing ain't going to solve. It culminates with a big race at the end, having one race in each tier of the cars, and in the end, you can win your starter car back. Terrible payoff. Driving-wise, the cars, they're very neat for speed. At low speeds, they handle like complete ass, and they only feel good going fast. Drifting tends to be quicker than gripping in most scenarios, and the bonus to your boost is definitely in favor of drifting. You go to the same meetups and race the same group of drivers that only cycle out on a per week basis. I can't tell you how many times I've run the same racetrack over and over just in a slightly more modified version of a car. There's an impressive car roster, but you win enough that you never have to buy a car unless you just really want something new. I ended up finishing the game with a Fox Body Mustang that started life out as a B-tier car that I won in the first week of racing. It had a problem when I was entering the S-plus tier because my upgrades made it pretty much undrivable in some races. You can balance between drift and grip, and I was at 50% right in the middle, but it felt like that was more of a chance of doing one or the other, so every turn was. It ended up being a surprise whether the car would kick the back end out or stay on track, which made driving kind of difficult. On top of racing, there's drift zones, speed zones, all different kinds of collectibles to pick up, artwork, and bears to smash. The drift zones are just about distance drifted, not speed or angle, but the drift events, which are like races, seem to take speed and angle into account. The overtake events are just about smashing obstacles while drifting or jumping over three laps. I was always in first by the end of the lap two, and it felt way too easy. 
If you're a big ASAP Rocky fan and were excited about his conclusion in the game, this is about the only time you see him is on those overtake events. And he just repeats the same line. So if you're looking into this game for him, just look up him saying, you drove it like you stole it, and you just got the full experience. If you're a die-hard Need for Speed fan, play Heat. That had co-op at least, which this is lacking. The 2015 reboot, which I think looked and drove better. Or if you're a driving game fan in general, look elsewhere. There's a ton of racing games that all do it better. Mark my words, this will be free on the Game Pass and as a PS Plus title within the next year. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a like and comment what you want to see next. Subscribe for more reviews, and we'll see you in the next one.